Okay, welcome to the Module 3 Conference Call Redo. This is Tim Herridge. I am alone today. It is simply George is with his family doing a father-son camp out. So I want to go ahead and just talk about Module 3, Lead Conversion. I'm going to start this week out like I do every week. And remind you that this strategy of wholesaling houses takes a considerable amount of time, approximately 15 to 20 hours per week. You need to be prepared to invest at least $500 a month to see measurable, worthwhile, and profitable results. <clears throat> You're going to have to be a good listener. The know-it-alls go broke. This is a, it, it will be an uphill battle if you do not learn to just listen and be a good communicator. So, module three lead conversion. Okay, buying a house, getting someone to agree to sell you your house at a discount starts from the time that your phone rings. This is one of the reasons in the Google voice module that we taught you guys about uh, that I like to personally have it where someone calls my Google voice number and it forwards to me it shows up as my actual Google voice number. So in, in my caller ID, it pops up Heritage Homes, and I know I've got a seller on the other line because that's the only thing that that number is used for. <clears throat> uh, you're going to talk, you're going to, in the document library area, you, you should find the inbound seller call sheet, uh, buy call worksheet. The thing about this is, uh, is, a script can give you guidance. A script can give you an idea of what to say. You practice scripts before you get on a call. And the biggest thing about the inbound call is you just have a conversation with the people. You, you, those of you that have been with me on days that I take calls, you've got to get over your fear and anxiety and just talk to them just person to person. Ask them a lot of questions, uh, but don't interrogate them. Most people don't want to be interrogated. Uh, you know, when, when you're talking about talking about buying a house, act as if, be presumptive, use a presumptive close. I mean, you know, when, when I buy your house, where are you going to move? Uh, if you can, get the loan information, but it's not a big hang-up. You don't have to have the debt information. Uh, you know, you want to find out why they're thinking about selling and when. This is going to give you an idea as to motivation, and where we always say, a deal is not a deal unless A, the seller has motivation, and B, the numbers work. So uh, you're going to need to answer the, you know, you got to answer the phone, and, and I prefer that you, you really need to book the appointment when the call comes in. You know, one of the things I always say is, uh, it's you can cancel, you can cancel an appointment. Oh, by leaving a voicemail, but you can't book an appointment. Uh, you know, let them know who you are and how you're different when you talk to them. Uh, let them tell, they, tell you their story. Sometimes you can say, tell, I'll just start off, i just say, tell them, hey, uh, tell me a little bit about your house. And Man, sometimes you can sit back for 10, 15 minutes and they'll just keep on talking. And if that's the case, just let them. Uh, you know, just relax. Act like they're an old friend that's calling you. If, and if you're nervous, You'll be okay. Just just slow down and let them talk. So, <clears throat> you know, when you call, when Dave calls, you just want to talk to Dave. Make sure you give him a discount statement. Make sure that Dave understands you're an investor. They're not just going to sell it for less than the realtor commission, and you're coming out to make a profit. Uh, at the very end, you can ask about their balance, but I'm telling you, when you're first starting, you might as well go see every house you can. <clears throat> you know, when you prepare for the appointment, especially before you really know these neighborhoods very well, I highly recommend that you take uh, a full 12 months of all statuses, active, pending, sold, canceled, leased, uh, withdrawn, Pin, uh, kick out every status available in 12 months for that area. And, you know, I, you know, I try to get everything from a half mile to a mile out. 
and really just narrow it down by square footage and drive the neighborhoods. You will, one, it puts you in the neighborhoods that you're targeting, but two, it, you'll learn a lot about neighborhoods and houses in general by driving the neighborhoods and looking for addresses and houses. You know, go ahead and print out maps. It's always a good idea to look at the, the property on Google Maps on the satellite view. Uh, <clears throat> that way you can see if the house backs up to certain commercial or the street over is a dead end street. You can just see what the neighborhood really looks like. When you're on the phone with them, ask them if there's any major repairs. I mean, some people will tell you, oh, well, the foundation's shot. And, and until you are experienced enough, what, you, what you're going to want to do is you may need to take a foundation or a roofing contractor out with you to the initial appointment. Make sure you account for travel time. The Dallas-Fort Worth area, for one, is it, it's hit or miss, and, and you've just got to don't be late to these appointments. Uh, the people are sitting at their home waiting on you, and the last thing you want to do is be late on the appointment. I mean, if you're planning on traveling on 635, you might as well add 20 to 30 minutes onto your travel time. But when you get to the house, the first thing you do, you drive past the subject property. You don't slow down too much. You just get a good look at it. Then you go drive through the comparables, and you just take a look at all the comparables you can find. Uh, this is really important because what happens is, a lot of times you may have a contemporary house that you're looking at and it may be a uh, traditional house that uh, you're comping it off of. And you just have to drive past the subject and really go drive past all the comparables. Make sure there's not a major di dividing street. You need to do that before the appointment. That way you can make an offer in person. You, know, you want to be early. Be five to ten minutes early, not fifteen. That's a little too early. But if you knock on the door five minutes early, that's fine. Uh, you know, dress casual, not lazy. To me, the dress code when you're looking at houses is a collared shirt, a pair of jeans, and uh, for me, it's boots and maybe tennis shoes or what have you. Uh, and the uh, You know, I mean, that, that's just, that's kind of a nice blue collar appearance and you don't want to show up in a suit or, and I really prefer you don't even wear slacks. Most of the people that you're, you're meeting uh, are, aren't going to be the most well-to-do people and you just don't want to, I mean, you want to, you want them to identify with you both in appearance and demeanor. So I wear blue jeans, a collared polo shirt and work boots. Uh, so, I mean, if you don't wear boots like I do, you can wear tennis shoes uh, or, or wing tips or whatever. Just, you don't want to look too fancy. Uh, you know, be nice. I, I, I go with students all the time and uh, people I've trained to work for me. It's always quite interesting uh, how some people will uh, attempt to be over-aggressive and, and, and have that bravado about them. And, it's just not necessary, and specifically when you're inside their house. You know, you got to respect their territory. It's their house, and you know, if someone came walking into your house and was uh, <clears throat> a bit abrasive, you're, you're less likely. It's going to make you even more uncomfortable than if you were at, say, an AT&T store. So you, I mean, you just want to make sure that you're nice and just polite and just humble. And you try, and, and, and you respect their territory, and you try to help them out. So then you get to walking the property. You know, as you're walking the property, this is where you get the opportunity to really get to know. Them. As you're walking the house, you look around on the walls, the doors, the, the shelves. Look for something you can identify with. For me, I was in the Marine Corps, so I always look for something to do with the military. Um, also a firefighter. I look for firefighter memorabilia. Uh, 
I'm a huge Dallas Cowboys fan, so that's another thing I look for, uh, football-related things. Uh, if they're a hunter, I try to, you know, there, there, there's a million things that uh, you can identify with, and you just got to keep your eyes open and find that thing that, and even if it's in the state, they'll identify with you if you can identify with something that was their parents. Uh, it may be somewhere you went on vacation. It could be just a whole host of things. Uh, things to look out for, uh, you, know, you know, watch for swells in the middle of a house. A lot of times a house, if it's swollen in the middle, when, when you get out of your, your vehicle, you should do the outside pan around. Uh, and, and, and if you see uh, in the middle of the house it's kind of sticking up or it's swollen, watch for that. A lot of times that's a sign of a sewer leak. Uh, look for aluminum wiring on houses built in the early 70s. Uh, this day and age, talk to them about the roof. See if the roof's been inspected since all the hail storms in May. Uh, roofs are becoming a newer concern. Uh, you know, just uh, those are some big ticket items that you may want to account for. Uh, you know, everything that you're looking for, build report, build report, build report. When you see, if you see a big one inch wide crack in the wall, you don't need to say, gosh, that's a big crack. They've seen it. Uh, you know, just mind your manners and if there's something that uh, you don't think they've noticed, find a way to point it out uh, by shining a flashlight at it or something of that nature. Just try not to, you know, just try to mind your manners. Pay attention as you're walking. Listen to them. They'll use buzzwords like, you know, need to get rid of want to get this done, things like that. And when you're walking the property, if you're being nice and kind, you'll pick up on those kind of things. Uh, fill out your field analysis worksheet. Try to determine what they owe as you walk around. Talk about when they bought the house. Talk about when dad financed it. Uh, you know, Find a way to work it into the conversation where it's not a, a direct question, but it's a converse, conversation piece. Okay, a lot of discussion around this topic. What, what do you offer? How to run the numbers? We're going to go over that in depth during this call. We'll talk about the considerations for the different types of properties they, there are. Uh, uh, it was brought to my attention this weekend while I was driving around uh, this week on Tuesday when I was riding around with a student. It was brought to my attention that there's a lot of things I know and I adjust for in the field that you guys may not be able to adjust for. So I'm going to talk about some of these things. When you're in a neighborhood, if it's a neighborhood full of duplexes, you're probably looking at a rental neighborhood. If you're in a neighborhood with a lot of uh, burglar bars or, or not many sold, sold properties, but several leased properties and a, a high amount of actives, that's telling you that the sale inventory in that neighborhood is not keeping up with the supply. So that's called an absorption rate. So I mean, if, if you've got 15 actives and only two sold, two or three solds, that's telling you that there's not much demand in the area. So then you want to turn around and look at how many active lease properties there are and how many leased properties there are. And you, what, you, what you'll most likely find in, in an area where there's a lot of actives and not many solds, you'll find very little active lease properties, but several leased properties, meaning that they have already been leased and, and a tenant now lives in the house. Um, so the difference is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in a, on a rental, you're going to look at the repairs a little bit different. Your ERC is, is going to be, you know, you're, you're not, uh, you're not necessarily going to count everything. And, and that's because this ERC is based off of what your target client's going to do. So, for instance, we were at a house on Tuesday that I'm trying to buy a mesquite, and I estimated the repairs at 15,000 just because I was fairly certain that no landlord would spend more than 15 grand on the house. Uh, whereas to go retail on the house, your estimate would be 22, 23. Now, I'll tell you, be careful doing that, especially as you start off, because uh, you just, if you've got to really understand where your clients are coming from, and that's where 
the power of networking comes in. You got to get out and talk to these people. You got to make sure that uh, that you understand your demand base and what your clients are looking for. I mean, you know, you don't want to send uh, George to a house and tell him it's a great retail house when it's actually more of a rental and you don't want to give him rental rehab numbers because he over rehabs his rentals. So it's all on your, on your client. So, and you just got to make an infield adjustment and, and, and it's all depending on the neighborhood and, you, and you'll know. I mean, when you drive around the neighborhood and you look at the comps and the data, you'll know if, it's a rent, if you're looking at estimating a rental rehab or a retail rehab. Okay, the SOS is, is the Smart Offer Sheet. It's an MS Excel worksheet. All right. Now, there are several different ways you can figure out what, uh, what, how, how, to, how to calculate your offer. And we're going to go over this again in just a second. Uh, make sure you have proof of funds. At this point, if you haven't got your proof of funds, you need to get with a hard money lender or a banker and you need to carry around proof of funds because when you make your offer, you want to be able to show them uh, that you have the money. It's just kind of like playing poker. I mean, if you don't have a whole bunch of money on the table, people don't really take you that serious. But when you've got a stack of chips in front of you, it, it adds some legitimacy to your bets. So um, what we're going to do here is get out of Microsoft PowerPoint and now I'm going to open up what is my my blank offer and my SOS worksheet. Okay, these are the different ways to calculate what to offer. Uh, so we're going to come up with a an example house. And this example house is worth one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Me, we're going to call this house one two three Main Street. It's in the USA subdivision and has a tax value of $147,000. Tax value. And it's an 1,800 square foot house. This is the SOS worksheet. It's available in the document library. This is an edited version of it. It's got some other little bells and whistles and I'll upload it to the Kajabi portal this afternoon whenever I upload this video. So. These houses, we'll say, in, over here by Main Street are selling for $85 a foot. You just put that right there. Now, we look at this house. Uh, we decide, and you're going to want to watch the What to Offer uh, module that's uploaded into the portal. It's got some really good stuff in there about how to calculate ERC, etc. And uh, one of our students, Rustin, has actually broken that down for me, and I'm actually working on putting that out to where you guys have a, a, a handout for all the different dollar per square foot items. Um, okay, so your ERC, we, we'll leave it at 12, 12, 12 bucks a foot. Full escrow, that's the closing cost for the buyer. 2% is 2% of the ESP is about what it costs to hold this property for four months. 6% is the commission that most investors build in to sell the house. 3% is the annual tax rate off the tax value and then times four months. And then the sale closing cost, that's the amount of closing cost that t investors typically pay when they sell the house. So the way this works is your ESP, your estimated sales price is 153000 which is nothing more than 1,800 square feet 
times $85 a foot. The ERC, the estimated rehab cost, is 1,800 square feet times $12 a foot. So then you've got your buy closing cost of $2,500, all these other costs, and then now you have to figure out what the investor wants to make in his profit. And this is where you have to get to know your end buyer. You know, this doesn't work. I mean, you can't just go put a bunch of stuff under contract and throw it against the wall and hope it sticks. So what we're going to do here is I know that there's a guy that I met that on $150,000 houses, he likes to make seventeen grand, seventeen five. dollars We'll call it $20,000. Okay, so this number here where it says $92,130 is the most that I can sell this house to that investor, assuming he agrees with my ESP and my ERC. So here, prospector wants, let's say we want to make $5,000 on an assignment fee. So then it tells us that the most we can offer is about $87,100. Now, that's on a straight calculation basis. That's basically backing into the numbers. There's also on tab two here in the same spreadsheet that I'm going to upload for you. You know all the uh, the numbers transpose. Well, almost all of them. Fix that one over here. Now this investor pays less in commissions. This is George's num these are George's numbers on the second page. And this shows you that under George's, since he pays less in escrow, he pays less in commission and builds in less for uh, uh, seller contributions, etc. This tells you that George could actually pay you ninety-seven thousand for the house. So to make your five, you could then offer up to ninety-two thousand. So you're you basically are able to bring in about five thousand dollars more because he pays less in fees and commissions when he sells the houses. So that's one way to do it, and that is based off of calculating the actual profit. Now. The other way to do this is based off of loan to value. Now loan to value is a very common approach used throughout the Metroplex and really everywhere of how to calculate, hang on a second, I'm trying to undock this so I can have one on one screen and one on the other. Isn't going to work. Okay. So this is the offer calculation sheet. The way this works is using the example of the spreadsheet that we were using. We have $153,000 house. So here in this tab, you just type in $153,000. Now, $153,000 falls into this bracket. Start out about 70%. The most you can go to is about 75%. So then you get to the repairs. Now remember, we were looking at 21.6 in repairs. Now, we know that the most we'll be able to wholesale this out for is about 80%. So what we're looking at is if we can go if we can go out there and put this house under contract for 85, we can make about 15 grand. 
up to 50 grand. If we put this house under contract for 93, we might be able to make 7,600. But I'll tell you, be very careful on that 80%. Matter of fact, I'm going to lower it for you guys. We'll make that. So basically, if you go all the way up to 93, you run the risk of only making $3,000. You stay at the 85, you can still make about 10. So here on tab one, it tells you to offer 87. This one's telling you 85. On tab two and this one, it's telling you about 92 is the most you can go up to. And here it's capping you at about 93. So these two will get you in the ballpark. I, okay, I mean, the deal is George uses the SOS. I use this blank offer worksheet. Most of the houses I target look about like this. And that's really and truly about the way it looks. And I just, I flex on these offers based off of what I think my demand is going to be, what my competition is, and how much I want to make. Because I'm going to tell you, if you know that you're bidding against eight or nine people, you really don't want to bother with uh, trying to get it for this 61000 uh, When you're bidding with eight or nine people, you need to get as close to your max offer as you can so that you know, you can uh, move the property. So let's plug these numbers into the SOS. 125. <laughs> On a 125 house, an investor should be fine with making 15000 So, I tell you, you should be able to wholesale it for about seventy three five. dollars which is about what we're saying here. And so, to make five grand, you should be able to offer sixty eight, which is here on the high side. So, I mean, the, the two are pretty much in line. Uh, they're a little different. Uh, one's based off of really knowing your demand, and the other's based off of just calculating uh, base profits. So get out there, network, 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 go meet people. And uh, that's the easiest way to uh, to really hone this in is knowing what people want and what they'll pay. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and open for questions. I have one question here. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're looking for me to go out with you, uh, you just need to, uh, I mean, I mean, you still need to book the appointment. Most of the time I'll be available. If I'm not, we can reschedule. It's easier to reschedule on a voicemail than it is to schedule on a voicemail. Any other questions? You guys need to watch all the videos. You need to commit to this process. You got to be careful with trying to overthink it. Uh, when, when you're making offers on houses, don't give people too many options. Don't go in start talking about sub two, talking about cash, talking about uh, options. You need to pick your poison and then live by it. No questions, really. That's just amazing to me. 
Guess you all got this whipped. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're just now seeing the offer calculation sheet, that just tells me that uh, you haven't read or watched the modules because it's been discussed multiple times. Uh, you know, when, when you know a house needs foundation work, uh, you know, it, it really just depends on how bad the foundation is. Uh, if, if it seems like something simple, it's only down on one end, then the uh, what to offer video will teach you to add three bucks a foot in for the foundation, and that should cover you. And only on a real crazy deal do you do I withhold an offer until I get a foundation estimate. Did you get that older home you looked at with Russell a few weeks ago? No, not yet, Eric. Uh, we're working on it. I talked to the sellers yesterday, and you know that it's five heirs, and they just hadn't made up their mind. Yeah, you know, someone just said. Uh, Someone just made a comment, and I, I'm not going to call their name, but I've talked to a lot of students this week, and I'm a bit perturbed at a little bit of it because I talked to students that say, yeah, I didn't really watch that module. I didn't think I needed to. Um, that's really rather amazing to me because, to be frank, as many houses as I've bought and as many transactions as I've done, as much money as you, you paid me, I would think you would want to listen to everything I have to say. Uh, some of you have skipped some very crucial mi couple minutes in some of these webinars that, I mean, it can cost you. So, I mean, you know, if, if you're not going to watch the whole webinar, I wouldn't even start watching the beginning because otherwise you're just learning half of it. And, I mean, there's just no need. It's just... I mean, you're really just wasting your time. Anybody else got any questions? Uh, you know, if the foundation is just down on one end, you really only need to repair it on that one end. But what we try to teach is we try to teach you guys to uh, – I don't, want, I don't want you getting bogged down and counting how many peers and adding up the engineer report and all that. A general estimate of $3 a foot will pretty much take care of it. Uh, and ultimately, it'll probably, be okay. it'll probably help you out if you miss the comps or something. I'd rather you be high on your rehab uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, that you don't offer too much and don't get stuck with a deal a deal that uh, isn't going to work for you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, let me see. Let's listen to this real quick. Hey, my name is Deborah Betag, B E T E G. I own the property at 1114 West Northgate Drive in Irving. I received your uh, letter and I'm interested in speaking with you. If you could please call me at 301. Okay, so I just got a call from someone with a property in Irving. Uh, I have my phone muted because I'm on this lovely buy call or lovely conference call. So for those of you that are still on the call, you can just listen to me return it. I'll try to get the audio as good as I can. Hello. Hi, Deborah. Hello. Deborah. Yeah. Hi, this is Tim Harris. Yeah. How are you? Good. How are you? Just fine. I'm sorry, could I uh, get your name again? Uh, this is Tim Harris. You called me. You said you got a letter about a house in Irving. Yes, just called about less than five minutes ago. 
you don't want to give it away? Correct. I'm still waiting for that one person that's going to call me and say they want to give me a house. Um, that, would be, that would be nice. Yeah, I know, right? That, that, that would make a great Friday afternoon. I'll tell you what, Deborah. I mean, the way it, the way it works is, you know, I'm an investor. Uh, I, didn't send you, I didn't send you that letter just because uh, I didn't, like, drive by your house and say, oh, I want, I want to buy that house. I'm an active investor. I send out about five or six thousand letters and postcards a month. But Irving is an area that I'm very interested in. So I mean, if you can tell me a little bit about the house, about your situation, about the location, uh, maybe. Sure. The house is. Um, I think it's about eight hundred thousand square feet. It's about eight hundred thousand We've been in the house since 1968. Um, it's a wonderful floor hey, plan. Hey, I got this lady on mute. Can you hear? Pretty good. Or not? It has three bedrooms, two full baths. Beautiful little floor plan. Uh, lovely floor plan. Um, it, uh, it's a wonderful location right at uh, MacArthur and Northgate uh, Drive, right around the corner from the Four Seasons, uh, probably about five blocks from MacArthur High, uh, High School right down the street. Uh, good school district. Um, and I'm just ready to sell it. Okay. And you said it's actually on Northgate? Yes, it's on Northgate, right at Nic uh, Northgate and MacArthur Boulevard. Uh, we're about the fourth house from the corner from MacArthur. And um, very good walking distance to um, uh, MacArthur High School and Travis Middle School. Uh, centrally located for, you know, uh, people that uh, work off of LBJ or or Carpenter Freeway. It's a very good location for the house. Okay, give me the actual number, door number again. 1114 West Northgate Drive. Okay. Well, uh, just looking at uh, your email address I'm get, or your phone number, I'm guessing do you live in the Dallas area or? Not right now, no. Okay. I'm out of state. Is there anybody here locally that could show me the house? Oh, I'm down here now. Oh, okay. I could show you the house. Now, that's a pretty busy street right through there. Uh-huh. you have any problems with people driving up in your yard or anything? Uh, no. No, not at all. Uh, here, probably about 10, 10 years ago, there was. And um, the neighbors complained so much uh, that the city came out and restructured the median strip and um, and we did the drive and everything like that. So does that happen? Absolutely not. Okay, it looks like it's a front entry drive. Okay, uh, well, I mean, I'd be happy to come take a look at it. Is there a time good for you this weekend? Or? Uh, the sooner the better. Okay. Is there any specific reason that you're looking to do this quickly, or? Um, uh, you know, I'm just ready to, um, uh, no, I live out of state, and I'm just ready to move on and, uh, and, uh, take the next step with the house, that's all. Well, I understand that. Well, uh, I've got two times available, uh, I could come out tomorrow morning about 10 o'clock. Or I could come out, okay. or I could come out Sunday afternoon. Uh, tomorrow morning would be wonderful. Okay, 10 a.m. That'll be great. Okay, great. Um, and, and this number I'm talking to you is this is a, is this a uh, cell phone number? A cell phone. Yes. Okay, so if I have a flat tire or something, then uh, this is the number to call. I'll tell you, I'm gonna be late. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well. Uh, 
this is my cell phone number that I'm calling you from. So uh, I've got everything I need, and I'll just see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. That'd be great. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. So if you're on this call and you wrote down that number, you better delete it. I don't want you snaking out my deal. Uh, so this is an interesting house, and, and, and since none of y'all were asking questions, we'll talk about this. Uh, I've got a little bit of time to kill. Uh, so the interesting thing is, one, I'm concerned that this is a fairly busy street. Now, it does have a divided median. Looks like it needs a new roof. Uh, let's see if we can pan over. And that appears to be the house. A little front entry with the garage. I mean, looks 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 like a pretty nice house. I mean, uh, you know, I'm I'm as I look at this house just from the street. The first thought in my mind is rental, because most investors like myself don't like to uh, buy, fix, and sell houses on busy streets. That's where you'll get into the, the comps issue of it being a white elephant. Uh, so, but with rents, it really doesn't matter that much. I mean, it's a rental is a rental is a rental. Now. There's a bit of an effect that it is front entry. I mean, a lot of times the front entry garages on busy streets are a little bit worse. I mean, you note the houses across the street. Uh, well, they're not actually even on Northgate. Those probably aren't Northgate addresses. They're probably Travis Circle addresses. Uh, let me zoom out a little bit. I didn't know there were actually residential houses front and Northgate through there. So the interesting thing is there's a lot this lady's not telling us on the phone, and this is why. I mean, you, you don't need to interrogate people because it doesn't really matter. She was uncomfortable with telling me the truth about why, quote, unquote, the sooner the better. Did y'all catch that? Uh, some of you that have, that have heard me talk more, uh, tell me what you're thinking. Did any of you know what type of lead that was right there? She said she got a letter from me. Yeah, probate, exactly, because the, the only time I waste the money on, on letters is probate. So it's interesting. I, I asked her twice, and neither time she told me that someone had passed away. She never let me know that it's an actual probate property, and she lives out of state, but she's in town this weekend. The sooner the better. She most likely inherited this house, lives out of state, and is in town trying to dispose of the residence. But she doesn't want to tell me that because... And you never know how these people are going to negotiate with you, and that's one of the beautiful things. You don't know if they, if their form of negotiation and their thought about negotiation is to lie. <laughs> you don't know if their thought about negotiation is to uh, to attempt to. A lot of times they try to build themselves up. Oh well, you know I know how to rehab a house, and I know this, and I know that. When a lot of times they, they <laughs> don't really know half of what they're saying they do. Uh, so it's very interesting. Uh, so anyway, it's very interesting. I, I want you guys to, uh, oh, we got a question. Uh, okay, a couple questions and this one question. Uh, how long do you ask for for the inspection? Uh, uh, Gary, I'm guessing you're saying how long of an option? Because I don't get options, and I tell you, you students not to get options either unless you need, feel like you need one. Uh, I try not to tie up the properties. I try to go in low enough to where I feel good about it. And if you don't feel good about it, I always tell people, try to get it at your price, and then if the seller makes you pay their price, then that's when you say, okay, well, I'll try to give you your price, but... You know, you know, I'm going to give you 20 bucks, and I need 10 days to back out. And then when they say, well, I, I don't want to give you the 10 days, you say, well, I mean, then maybe you can sell it to me at my price. I've got one in Garland right now that I offered them an option of 5000 more than my original offer, and now I found out on, th on Thursday night that they're actually going to take my original offer because they need the guarantee because the, the mom 
is moving to Austin to be with her son and grandkids and is having a, a townhome built and needs to put down hard earnest money. So they'd rather have the guarantee than the option. So at that $5,000 lower price, uh, you know, Gary, I would tell you the difference between when to get an option and uh, when not to get an option is kind of on this blank offer worksheet, the difference between me paying the seller 61 or me paying the seller 65. Because if the seller sells to me for 61, I know I got a good deal. I don't need an option. 67, eh, I'm a little iffy. I'm going to go ahead and protect myself. Hope that makes sense. You don't need to use hard money. This is just, you're, you're, you're putting it under contract, and then you just assign your contract. You flip your contract over to the end buyer. You don't need hard money. You, you just need the hard money to show proof of funds. It's just one of those things that it's not really what it seems to be. I mean, it just shows... Hard money proof of funds letter just shows that you can get the money that you're offering them. Have a good weekend, Ashley. Yeah. Any other questions? Nope. Oh, wait. One more. Uh, the closings, when you get to next week, and if you listen to the modules that are already out there, uh, the uh, um, I schedule my closing uh, 30 days out. Brian, you said, uh, Brian, do you have a mic and speakers? Yeah. Uh, the the 30 days out gives me plenty of time to find a, a buyer and will you too as long as when, we, when you get to the marketing and promotion portion as long as you uh, follow the steps and get on it quick hey Brian I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you Brian can you hear me yeah sure hey, Brian uh, I'll do a quick update and then we'll start talking everybody uh, Brian went on another one of his buy calls today uh, Brian this is his second month marketing uh, I, I He's not getting a whole lot of calls, but I know he's went on a couple of appointments in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Brian was talking about a deal he just went on. And uh, Brian, did you update your SOS yet? Could you uh, shoot that to me so I can display it on the screen? I did that already. You got it. Okay. Well, let me get into my outlook because... I sent you two. The last one is the, the actual offer SOS. Ah, okay. Let's see. Well, why don't you, while I'm pulling that up, why don't you just kind of talk about the appointment, the call, when it came in, when you went, what you felt, what you, and then kind of the overall situation right now. Sure. I uh, received a call. I think it was Tuesday. Uh, seemed to be a motivated seller. Uh, she received one of my cards. Uh, the house was in the colony. So I went there today. Uh, the uh, the end result was the house is in good condition. I mean, I went on the low end of the SOS, ten dollars square foot. Um, looked like it was just carpet paint and a few uh, outside modifications, but overall it looked good. And so, uh, based on the SOS, I uh, offered her fifty four, and then at that time she told me that she owes seventy five. So. Immediately, my mind went into rental mode, and uh, I said that there's possibly an owner finance option we can do. And she's going to call me Monday. Okay, so you offered 54 on this house is on the screen here. Yes. Okay, so how do you feel about, uh, in general, the, uh, the, the comps? Do you feel pretty solid on those? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So it's a pretty small house, 989 square feet? Yep, correct. And the comps, uh, the houses were around 1,000 square feet. The ones that have been updated were going for right around uh, 100. Um, right. And so uh, based on the average, which was 96, 
uh, $96 a square foot. I, I came up with that price. And how'd she get your marketing piece? Did you figure out if she was, is she an absentee owner? Um, yeah, she's an absentee owner. Correct. Okay. How long? Just my, I'm sorry. She just said it was myself and one other person that she uh, responded to. So only two people sent her cards, which I thought was interesting. Well, I mean, it's like I've been telling you, that area's really not worked that hard. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if you offer 54, I mean, I think you're right on the nose. And, and there's just, you know, it's one of those things that it, it, it's so hard when you first get into this business because, I mean, you're sitting here and you're thinking, gosh, you know, this, I, I can, someone could get this house for 20 grand less than it's worth. I mean, and that's 20% equity. And, uh, you know, it's like, Brian, you and I have talked so many times that sometimes those deals that it's like, man, this is a good deal, it just doesn't play out. And yeah. uh, so as far as their, uh, their mortgage and everything, did they seem willing to let someone take it over? Yeah, she's definitely very motivated. What's her motivation factor? Uh, she wants to get out from under uh, renting properties because she hates the the day to day grind of having to go there for you know a tenant calls her and has wants something fixed. She doesn't want to deal with that anymore. Yeah, uh, tell you, <laughs> I've had you know I've had good experiences as a landlord, but. Uh, that's that. There's a lot of people that are going to call you, and, and uh, they're they're done being a landlord. Uh, well, Brian, you got anything else to add on this deal that I'm showing on the screen? No, I just uh, looking forward to the call on Monday. Uh, uh, hey, and uh, did you go look at that house in Flower Mound? Oh, you bet I did. What do you think about that? I think it's a it's a winner. Um, cutting the video this afternoon, and you'll have it tonight. Okay. Well, uh, the guy had said it was worth about three fifteen after you drove the comps. What did you think? Yeah, definitely worth three fifteen. Do you think more or less or? Uh, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but that's yeah, your job. that's okay. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe a little bit more just because of the pool, but I don't know if that's factored in. But you know, it's well, a let's call nice it three twenty. Uh, were yeah. you able to review any of the? Uh, uh, mortgage paperwork that said how far behind he was or no I, I never reviewed any of that here's the, here's the uh, the well the problem areas I found definitely need carpet definitely need there's wood floors they need to be redone uh, I saw hail damage on the uh, roof and there are three air conditioning units one of them is bad so I was able to find that out so but it's, I mean, it's every bit of 20. 20 grand, it sounds like. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, even if you could wholesale this thing out at 80%, uh, it looks like the guy need. he said he owes about 240. 240. I mean, there's no money there. So, yeah. we've got, we'll, we'll have a couple options that we'll look into. Uh, one, did he say how far behind he was? No, but he was definitely very motivated. He wanted to know how soon I said you would call him. He wanted to know, well, will that be three weeks from now, a couple days when? Well, I what did you 20, tell him? 24 hours. Oh, so I have till tomorrow morning? Yep. Okay, well, I'll call, <laughs> I'll call him on my way to Irving. Brian, thank you. Anybody else got any questions, comments, concerns, anything they want to talk about? I'm more than happy to unmute any of you if you want to talk, uh, if you don't want to type. Oh, people are starting to leave. <laughs> I guess we're boring them. Uh, okay, I, I guess that's going to wrap it up. Uh, you know, guys, just please, I mean, I can't say this enough. I mean, don't waste your money with me. I mean, you paid, you're in. Now, set time aside. Don't try to overdo it. If you just can only watch one video a day, only watch one video. But if you, if you don't take the time, and, and, and Brian, those of you that don't know Brian, Brian is actually, he helps us do a lot of the videos, and uh, he and I have kind of become friends over the last uh, eight months since we've been working on Flip That Contract, and Brian and I bend each other's ear a lot, and he's been kind of a, a, a test case for me, but even Brian, he, 
he gets around me and he hears me say all these things and he starts skipping modules. And, you know, me as a trainer, guys, I mean, I could sit here and act like I truly just love saying the same thing a hundred times, but I don't. Remember, I'm a real estate investor first and so is George. And uh, we do this to help people. We do this to train. We enjoy it. But don't just skip the modules and then call me or text me and ask for help. So, I mean, just please, please, please take the time, show some respect for what it is we've done here, and uh, try to watch the modules. So, uh, until next Friday, uh, go forth and kill and conquer. Uh, we did get an update on the portal. The real estate, the portal will, it, it is now supposed to be finished no later than uh, the 17th. We should be testing by then. Uh, we're really excited about that. And, uh, uh, you know, that'll be, that'll be good stuff. So uh, until next time, I'm Tim. If you haven't bought your tickets to the REI Expo, I highly recommend you do that. And uh, we'll see you down the road.